Chapter 5 is going to be a more in-depth look into the lipids or fats category. The first thing that we want to know is what are lipids made of. Now for our carbohydrates, if you remember, we said carbohydrates are made of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and fats are the same thing. They're also made of those three atoms, but they have a very different structure as you can see on this page. So for the building block of carbohydrates, we have what we call fatty acids. So the fatty acids are composed of first a chain of carbons, which is a bunch of carbons linked together. And then we have on one end, we have the methyl group, sometimes referred to as the omega end. And then on the other side, you'll find the carboxyl group, which is sometimes referred to as the alpha end. Now, it's very important to be able to recognize which side is the methyl group, because it won't always be on the left hand side. Sometimes you'll see it on the right hand side. So you need to be able to recognize that the methyl group is CH3 or a carbon with three hydrogens attached to it. So whenever you are looking at a fatty acid structure like this, you're going to look for the end that has a carbon attached to three hydrogens. That will be your methyl group. Now you'll notice that in a fatty acid we also have a bunch of hydrogens. And these hydrogens are going to determine the structure and the function of the fatty acid. So let's go ahead and take a look at the different ways that fatty acids can be categorized. The first way that they can be categorized is based off of their length. And this is referring to the length of the carbon chain. So if there are less than six carbons strung together, then this is called a short chain fatty acid. And then we have between six to 10 carbons, we call medium chain, and fatty acids that have a chain of 12 to 24, we call long chain fatty acids. And those are actually the most common. Another way that we can categorize our fatty acids is based off of how many hydrogens there are on the structure. We said that we have a fatty acid chain that will always have carboxyl on one end and a methyl group on the other end, and then carbons in the middle. And from our previous slides, we saw that the carbons usually have hydrogens on them. The reason we don't have hydrogens here is because we're gonna go ahead and draw them in in a minute. This is because the amount of hydrogens that are there are gonna be what differentiate whether it is a saturated or unsaturated fatty acid. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we have so far. If we take a look at each of the carbons in the chain, each of them already has two bonds, one bond on the left and one bond on the right, holding the carbons that are next to it. So each carbon has two bonds attached to it. But remember, carbon always has to have four bonds. So technically, each one of these carbons needs two more bonds in order to fulfill its bond requirement. So if we wanted to go ahead and add our hydrogens on here, the maximum amount that each carbon could carry would be two hydrogens each because of the fact that they're already using two, hydrogen, two bonds, one on the left and one on the right. So we only have two bonds left to use for attaching hydrogen. So if we wanted to go ahead and fill this up and allow each carbon to carry its maximum capacity of hydrogen, again, each carbon only has two bonds left, so that would mean the maximum each carbon can carry is two hydrogens each. So let's go ahead and fill up these carbons with the maximum capacity of hydrogen. And what we have here is each carbon carrying two hydrogens each. If we take a look at the bonds now, this carbon has one bond down here, second bond on the left, third bond at the top, and fourth bond on the right. So we have four bonds on the carbon, and that's what the carbon is supposed to have. So by adding two hydrogens onto each carbon, each of the carbons now has its four bond requirements met, and that means that each carbon couldn't possibly carry any more hydrogens. 
it's already used up all of its bonds, it could only carry two hydrogens each, and now it's maxed out its bond requirement. Now, what this means is that this fatty acid is carrying the maximum amount of hydrogens that it could possibly carry. Or another way to say it is that it is fully packed or fully saturated with hydrogens. And that's why this kind of fat we would call a saturated fatty acid, because it is fully saturated with hydrogens. Now, if it wasn't carrying hydrogen to its maximum capacity, if it was missing some hydrogens, if it wasn't fully saturated with hydrogens, that's when we would call it an unsaturated fatty acid. And that's what you see over here. So if you take a look, up until this middle portion, each one of these carbons is carrying its maximum capacity. Each one is carrying two hydrogens each, fulfilling its four bond requirement. But when we reach this part in the middle, each one of these carbons is only carrying one hydrogen each. It's using its other bond to attach twice to the carbon next to it, or what we have here as a double bond. So this isn't carrying hydrogen to its maximum capacity because this bond that is bonding twice to the carbon next to it is technically being wasted because it could have been brought down here and used to add more hydrogens on. So again, this fatty acid is not carrying hydrogen to its maximum capacity because these carbons are only carrying one hydrogen each and they're wasting their fourth bond attaching to each other again instead of allowing that fourth bond to come down and attach another hydrogen there. Since we're not carrying our maximum amount of hydrogens, it's not fully saturated with hydrogens or it is referred to as an unsaturated fat. One way to be able to tell that it is unsaturated is just to look for the double bond. Because as we just demonstrated, if a double bond is there, that means there is, an, the, there is another bond that is being wasted that could have been used to attach more hydrogens instead of bonding twice to whatever is next to it. So anytime hydrogens are missing, there will always be a double bond fulfilling that fourth bond requirement since hydrogen didn't use up that fourth bond. So again, anytime hydrogens are missing, we fulfill that fourth bond requirement by bonding twice to what's next to it. Or another way to think of it is anytime you see a double bond, it's an automatic giveaway that it is unsaturated because that other double bond could have been used to add hydrogens instead of bonding twice to what is next to it. Another thing that I want to point out is you'll notice that where the double bond occurred, the structure was bent. And this is going to be something that we're going to see in a little more detail later. We'll learn exactly why this happens in a minute. But for now, I just want you to understand that whenever we have unsaturated fats, that means a double bond will occur, and wherever that double bond occurs, it causes the structure to bend. Now this here shows us how these uh, double bonds can, that create this kink can affect the structure of our fats. So if you take a look, we have two triglycerides here. Remember, a triglyceride is a, um, tri is a structure of fat with a glycerol backbone and three fatty acids attached. With the triglyceride that we have on the left, this is completely saturated. It's not showing us the hydrogens. Sometimes you'll see a structure like this that doesn't completely show us all of the um, bonds that are there, all of the atoms that are there. It's a more simplified structure. But when you take a look at this, the way that you're going to be able to tell if it is saturated or unsaturated is to look for any additional lines. For example, right here, we have two lines instead of one. That's a double bond. Same thing over here. Remember, we know that if there is a double bond, that means hydrogens are missing and it's unsaturated. So even though we don't see the hydrogens here, they're not displaying them for us, you can easily figure it out by just looking for where the double bonds are.
this one on the left, we said it is completely saturated because there are no double lines anywhere. So there are no double bonds. And that means it is saturated. Now, because it's saturated, it doesn't bend. And since it doesn't bend, that means the fats can stack very tightly against each other. Whereas with the triglyceride that we have on the right, one of the fatty acids is creating this kink upwards, it's bending upwards because of the double bond. And the fatty acid down here is also unsaturated with a double bond that causes it to bend downwards. Remember, we said anytime there is a double bond, it causes a kink or a bend in the structure. Now, the problem with this is it has created some gaps for us due to the bend. And if we wanted to go ahead and stack another fatty acid on top of it, with the saturated fat, we could stack it very tightly right here on top of it. With the unsaturated one, we can't stack it right here because it would then bump into this portion. Since it bends upwards, we have to take this into consideration and stack the fat up here where it will fit. Same thing down here. We could stack another fatty acid very tightly down here. There is no bending, it would fit. Down here, we couldn't stack the fatty acid immediately under because then it would bump into this part over here. So we have to stack it a little bit lower so that it doesn't bump into this part here, and that would create even more gaps. So again, when we have an unsaturated fat, it creates a double bond, and where that double bond occurs creates a bend or a kink in the structure. That bend makes it so that these structures are not stacked as tightly. There are gaps in between them, and when we try to stack other fats on top of them, they're not going to be able to stack very tightly either. Now, this matters for a few reasons. The first reason is going to be because it will affect the state of the fat, whether it is solid or liquid. With this structure over here, it's not stacked very tightly. It has a more loose structure or a more fluid structure which means that it's going to be more liquid at room temperature. Whereas with the saturated ones, since they don't bend and they can stack very tightly, they're going to be a lot more dense or they're going to be more solid at room temperature. So that bend and the gaps that it creates makes the unsaturated fat liquid at room temperature and the saturated, since they don't bend, they can stack tightly, they're going to be more solid at room temperature. The other thing is that this is going to affect how stable the fat is or how easily it will spoil. The reason for this is because uh, fats can basically spoil when they are exposed to oxygen. The more oxygen exposure, the more quickly a fat will spoil. Now with the saturated one, we could have oxygen being exposed to the outside of the fat from over here, from over here, from the side. But the one on the right, our unsaturated fat, we could also have oxygen exposure from the outside, but we also have oxygen being exposed to the inside parts of the fatty acid because of these gaps. So these bends that create these gaps allow more of the fatty acid to be exposed to oxygen. More oxygen can come in here. So more of the fatty acid is going to make contact with the oxygen, which means this fat, the unsaturated one, is going to spoil more quickly. Again, the more a fat is exposed to oxygen, the more quickly it will spoil. The unsaturated one is more exposed to oxygen, because it has these gaps in here where oxygen can also get into and access more of the fat, break down more of the fat, and cause it to spoil more quickly. So that property, the bending that happens due to a fat being unsaturated, can definitely affect the properties of the fat itself. Now this here is just a recap of the differences in the characteristics and here is a picture that shows you what we were referring to. So here we have triglycerides that are all uh, that have fatty acids that are all saturated. So you see each fatty acid stacks very tightly on top of the next one and they can also stack tightly next to each other. So this is going to be more solid at room temperature like for example the butter. 
whereas this oil over here is mostly made out of unsaturated fats. So you'll see that there are these bends in the structure that create these gaps, and when they try to stack near each other, the bends make it so that they stack further away. It creates more gaps in the structure. They can't stack very tightly, and so because of this, their structure is more loose, and so it's going to be more liquid at room temperature. So same thing goes for the oxygen. You see this unsaturated fat has a lot more gaps for the oxygen to get into, whereas for the saturated one, we don't have oxygen being exposed in between these fatty acids, at least, because they are stacked very tightly. Each three are stacked very tightly on top of each other, whereas where these unsaturated ones, we have these gaps in each one of them where more oxygen is able to enter. So since unsaturated is more exposed to oxygen, it's gonna spoil more quickly. Saturated, not as exposed, so it's not going to spoil as quickly as our um, unsaturated. Now the next thing that we're gonna look at is how do we name fatty acids, in particular the unsaturated ones. Now, remember, we said that we want to know what the methyl group looks like. And the methyl group, if you remember, is CH3, or a carbon attached to three hydrogens. So the first thing that we want to do is locate this. In this example here, it's again on the left-hand side. So now that we've located the methyl group, we can move on to step two, which is we are going to start counting the carbons from the methyl group end. And what we're trying to do is find the very first carbon that has a double bond attached to it. Now, remember, there is a carbon that's part of the methyl group, and that one is counted as well. So, in this example, if we start counting from the methyl, or another, in other words, the omega end, we're going to count the first one that's in the methyl group. That will be our carbon number one. And then we have carbon number two. And then carbon number three has a double bond attached to it. You see I've circled it in green. So carbon number three is the very first double bond, uh, very first carbon attached to a double bond from the methyl end. And now that we have that number, carbon three, all we have to do is attach the word omega before it. So in this example, we would put omega before 3, and it would become an omega-3 fatty acid. If we counted carbons, and the sixth carbon was the one that had the first double bond attached to it, then we would have called it an omega-6 fatty acid. So all we're doing is counting from the methyl end to find the first carbon attached to a double bond. Now, if you made the mistake of counting from the carboxyl or the alpha end, the one in blue, you would have had a completely different answer. If we count from that end, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine carbons that come before the double bond. So counting from that end would have given you omega-9 instead of omega-3. And so you want to make sure that you know how to recognize the methyl end because that will let you know where to start counting from. And again, always remember to count the carbon that is part of the methyl group. Now the last type of fatty acid that we're going to discuss is the trans fatty acids. Trans fats are technically a type of unsaturated fats, so we're going to take a look at the unsaturated fat and see how it will technically become a trans fat instead. So over here we have our unsaturated fat. Remember, unsaturated means it's missing some hydrogens and it has a double bond. Now, remember that we said with the unsaturated fats, where they have the double bond, the structure will bend. And so when they try to stack together, there are these gaps that are going to be make, making it more susceptible to spoilage because the more the structure is exposed to oxygen, the quicker it'll spoil. So when food manufacturers have this kind of situation, 
where they have unsaturated fats in their product, they know that the extra gaps is going to make their product spoil more quickly. And so they want to fix that situation. Now, if you think about how we would fix the situation, if we work backwards for where that problem came from, the reason that their product is more susceptible to spoilage is because there are gaps causing more oxygen exposure. The reason there are gaps is because there is a double bond causing the structure to bend. The reason there is a double bond is because hydrogens are missing. So if we go back to the source that way, we know that one way that we can eliminate those gaps is by adding hydrogen in because the whole issue started from hydrogens missing that created double bonds, double bonds created the kinks, the kinks created the gaps. And so if we go back to the source of the problem, it was the fact that there were hydrogens missing. So if we have add hydrogens in, we can eliminate some of those double bonds and make it so that there is no need for the structure to bend anymore and it will look more like a saturated fat and we can eliminate those gaps that are being um, that are making the structure more exposed to oxygen. And that's what food manufacturers want. We don't want, they don't want their product to spoil quickly. They want it to have a long shelf life. And so what a lot of food manufacturers will do is they will add hydrogen in to try to eliminate some of those double bonds, some of those kinks, and make it stack more tightly so that it's not as exposed to oxygen and it can have a longer shelf life. The process that we use to add these hydrogens in is what we call hydrogenation. Now, when we hydrogenate, the end result is what we call a trans fat. So trans fats are sat unsaturated fats that have been hydrogenated. So let's take a look at what exactly that means. One thing you might have noticed when we looked at the other unsaturated fats up until now, the hydrogens that were missing were always missing on the same side. So for example, the hydrogens that are missing here are both missing from the bottom. There isn't one missing from the bottom and one missing from the top. They're both missing from the bottom. That was the case in all of the pictures of unsaturated fats that we've shown so far, because that tends to be how it occurs in nature. Whenever there is an unsaturated fat, the hydrogens that are missing are always missing on the same side of the chain. Now, what this causes is an imbalance of hydrogens. If we count how many hydrogens we have at the top and the bottom, we have six hydrogens at the top and now only four hydrogens at the bottom. And that imbalance is what causes the structure to have to bend wherever the double bond is. So again, in normal unsaturated fats, wherever the hydrogens are missing, they will always be missing from the same side. What that causes is an imbalance in the number of hydrogens in the top and bottom, and that imbalance causes the structure to bend at that double bond at the location where the hydrogens are missing. Now, when we hydrogenate, Hydrogenation will fill up some of these gaps, so it'll add hydrogens and eliminate the need for a double bond, but usually it won't fill up all of the gaps. So we'll st still have a bunch of other double bonds, and not all of them will get hydrogens to fill up their missing bond requirement. So we will usually still have some double bonds present even after we hydrogenate. But another thing that hydrogenation does is it actually can cause the hydrogens that are present to shift places. So what we see over here. So what this is showing us is a structure that has been hydrogenated. So this is the same structure we were looking at, but instead of both of the hydrogens missing at the bottom, after hydrogenation, remember hydrogenation can also cause the current hydrogens to shift places. And that's what happened. The hydrogen at the top moved to the bottom. So that's the structure we have here. We still have two hydrogens missing, but now one is missing from the top and one is missing from the bottom instead of both of them missing from the bottom. So hydrogenation can also cause the hydrogens to shift places. And what that actually does, if we count the number of hydrogens now, we have one, two, three, four, five hydrogens at the top, one, two, three, four, five hydrogens at the bottom. 
So hydrogenation, when it caused the hydrogens to shift places, it actually balanced out our hydrogens again. So even though we still have a double bond, we no longer have that imbalance in hydrogens. And remember, we said the reason that it needed to bend where the double bond was, was due to an imbalance of hydrogens. We no longer have an imbalance. So even though this structure has a double bond, it actually will not bend. So what this structure is, where we have an unsaturated fat, where there is a double bond, but it is not bending, that is what we call a trans fat. So again, just to recap, when we hydrogenate, we are adding hydrogens into a food product. It will fill up some of the gaps where hydrogens were missing, but what it will also do is the places that didn't get to receive hydrogen, it will shift the places of those hydrogens. And when it does that, and we have one missing from the top, one missing from the bottom, it balances out the hydrogens, and that causes the structure to no longer need to bend, even though there is a double bond present. So this is not going to bend at all. It's going to stack tightly, just like a saturated fat would. And that's all that the food manufacturers care about. They just want to eliminate those gaps. They want it to stack tightly, like a saturated fat, so that we no longer have those gaps that will make it spoil more quickly. So this is going to be the result of hydrogenation. Is a, is a fat that is technically unsaturated. It has double bonds, but it does not bend. So it actually looks and acts like a saturated fat instead. So hydrogenation is what creates trans fats. Now this over here is just showing us the same thing um, just in a different form. So the picture on the left is what a normal unsaturated fat looks like. You see that the height, the place where we have a double bond, they're showing us that the hydrogens that are missing are both missing from the bottom. That creates an imbalance and causes the structure to bend. After we hydrogenate, it caused one of the hydrogens to move to the bottom instead. And so you see on the right now, we have a structure that still has a double bond, but it's no longer bent because we have moved one hydrogen to the other side and balanced out those hydrogens. And so on the left, we have just a normal unsaturated fat where the double bond causes a kink. On the right, we have an unsaturated fat that is now technically trans because it is no longer bending even though it does have a double bond. Now that we know everything we need about the fatty acid, which is our building block of our fats, we can go ahead and take a look at how these building blocks come together to form different types of fats or lipids. So we're going to be talking about the three main categories, which are triglycerides, phospholipids, and sterols. So let's go ahead and take a look at each one individually. Starting off with our triglycerides. Triglycerides are, are the main dietary fat, which means that when you get fat from a meal, it's primarily going to be in triglyceride form. Now, the way that triglycerides are made is they will have a glycerol backbone, which is what you see in the picture, and then we have three fatty acids attached to that glycerol. So a triglyceride is made from one glycerol and three fatty acids. Next we have our phospholipids. Phospholipids, as you can see, have a very similar structure. We have the glycerol backbone and then we have two fatty acids at the top. But the one thing that's different is instead of a third fatty acid, we have a phosphate group. Now, the important thing about this is that the phosphate group is actually hydrophilic. Now remember, fats are usually hydrophobic, they're afraid of water. And these that we're talking about now are different categories of fats, so they should all be hydrophobic. 
but this one is the exception. The rest of the structure, the fatty acids in this structure, are going to be hydrophobic, but it now has part of it that is hydrophilic because of the phosphate group. That makes it very unique because that means that it can work in both situations, hydrophilic and hydrophobic. It also means that it can kind of act like a peacemaker and bring those two different substances together, just like we learned bile did. So phospholipids are actually going to have a lot of roles. As for the roles of phospholipids, because of its ability to mix with water and fat, it is something that is very commonly added into different food products that have both oily and watery ingredients. So for example, things like mayonnaise or salad dressings are normally going to separate into two different layers. But food manufacturers add phospholipids to act as emulsifiers in these foods, and those are able to bring the water layers and the oily layers together so that it is one mixture. So that is the very first role of phospholipids, is they are able to emulsify uh, different substances in the food industry when they're added to a food product. The next important role for phospholipids is something that we're going to look at in a little bit more detail later on in this chapter, but it is the ability of phospholipids to help transport fats. Again, we'll look at this a little later, but for now, it is something that is able to help fats become transported in the lymphatic system. Lastly, it is able to make the cell membrane. In this picture that you see here, cell membrane will have the uh, hydrophilic layer on the outside and hydrophobic layer on the inside, and that is using phospholipids to develop this layer. Last category we have is sterols, and sterols are actually very different in structure than the previous two that we've looked at. The uh, picture you see there in green is an example of a sterol. So it is a ring structure rather than the different chains of fatty acids and glycerol and so on. Now, there are two main types of sterols that we can find. We can find sterols in animals, which are referred to as cholesterol. That's what the sterol stands for at the end of the word cholesterol. And then we can also find sterols in plants, which we just call plant sterols or phytosterols. Now, cholesterol is actually something that is needed in our body, so this isn't necessarily the bad fat. We do have several different uses for cholesterol, and uh, we've already talked about one of them. Remember, we said that bile is made of cholesterol, so that's a really important role. Also, you'll see here that in the picture underneath cholesterol, we have a structure that looks practically identical, and that's the structure of vitamin D. And that's because cholesterol can actually be used to make vitamin D as well. So cholesterol does have some important roles, but our body actually makes cholesterol itself, and so we don't really need uh, much additional cholesterol from foods. Now, that being said, the cholesterol that our body makes is the same thing in animals. Any kind of mammal will make cholesterol. So when we talk about where we get cholesterol from, it is only going to be in foods that come from animals. When you eat a food that comes from an animal, such as meat, you are basically going to be consuming the cholesterol that the animal's body was manufacturing. So that's how we're able to obtain cholesterol from other foods. Foods that don't come from an animal will not contain cholesterol in them. Now that we know the different types of fats that are available, we can go ahead and learn about what happens when we put them into our body, which starts off with digestion. Now we've learned about digestion of fats already for the most part. We learned that fats are hydrophobic and the digestive enzymes are hydrophilic. So they are not able to make contact with each other until bile is available to emulsify them and bring them together. And that process happens in the small intestine, 
where fat digestion begins and the bile is sent from the gallbladder. Now, if you remember, we said that fat digestion is not actually completed by the bile. Bile just helps the enzymes come together with the fat and then the enzymes do the digestive work. At the time, we didn't need to know the name of the digestive enzyme. If you remember, we said the pancreas releases a bunch of, a bunch of pancreatic enzymes, and the one for fat was pancreatic lipase. Anytime you hear the term lipase, that's referring to an enzyme related to lipids or fat. So again, what is happening is the pancreas is releasing pancreatic lipase into the small intestine, but that pancreatic lipase isn't able to make contact with the fat because fat is hydrophobic and lipase is hydrophilic. So bile is sent from the gallbladder into the small intestine to bring those two together, and then pancreatic lipase is able to digest the fat. Now after digestion, we have absorption and transport of fat. Now, we already know the different transport systems that are available, but before we actually get into that, we need to take a look at how fats are able to become a part of the intestinal cells. Remember, the small intestine is lined with cells and all of our nutrients absorb into these cells and wait to be transported. Now, fats are not able to just pass the cell membrane and enter into the cell. They actually need to form something called a micelle, which helps them move past the cell membrane and enter into the cells of the small intestine in order to be absorbed. And then they are able to go ahead and choose one of the two transport systems, either the vascular or lymphatic. Now let's take a closer look at why it is that fats need to be made into micelles before they can be absorbed. Now remember, our nutrients are all being absorbed into the cells of the small intestine, and that's where they're going to be stored and waiting around to be picked up and transported to wherever they are needed. So again, our, all of our nutrients, including our fats, are trying to be absorbed into the cells of the small intestine. The cells of the small intestine have a cell membrane around them that looks like this. Now, we just learned that the cell membranes are made out of phospholipids, or what we called a phospholipid bilayer. That's what you see here. So here we have two layers of phospholipids. The blue is the phosphate heads that are hydrophilic, and the tails that you see on the inside, those are the fatty acids that are part of the phospholipids. And we have two layers of them facing each other. That's what makes our... Um, phospholipid bilayer or the cell membrane. So if you think about it that way, that means that the very outer part of the cell membrane is actually hydrophilic because we have the hydrophilic heads on the outside. So because of that, and, be and since we know that our fats are hydrophobic, the hydrophobic fats are not going to be able to pass through this cell membrane as is. They're going to come towards it, realize it's hydrophilic, and want to run away from it because hydrophobic doesn't like to mix with hydrophilic. And so we need to go ahead and do what we did before when we wanted a hydrophobic and hydrophilic substance to mix, and that is give the hydrophobic fat a hydrophilic layer around it. And that's what you see over here. That is the micelle that we created. So what the micelle is, again, it's the fat on the outs inside with a hydrophilic layer on the outside. And that makes it so that when the fat is in this micelle form and it comes to pass the cell membrane, the fat itself now has a hydrophilic outer layer. So it's going to be fine entering through the hydrophilic part of the cell membrane. So again, the reason that we need to form micelles for absorption is because the outer part of the cell membrane is hydrophilic. Fats will refuse to come near the cell membrane and pass through it while they are still in their hydrophobic state. If we can give them a hydrophilic outer layer, they will feel comfortable coming near the cell membrane and passing through it, and then finally entering into the cell where they will be stored until their, the body needs to use them. 
Now in this picture, we're seeing again the cell that the fats need to enter. And at the top, you see we have formed a micelle, and that micelle is now going to allow the fat to penetrate into the cell. Now one thing that you'll notice is once the micelle enters the cell, it actually starts to separate into all these different arrows. You see phospholipids, cholesterol, free fatty acids, etc. And what's actually happening here is the micelle is dismantling and releasing all of the individual fats that were inside of it. The reason that we do this is because after the fats are absorbed into the cell, the fats are then going to be able to choose which transport system they're going to enter. Now remember the small fats can actually enter the vascular system. They don't need to go through the lymphatic one. And so some of these fats that were packaged into the micelle might be small enough to go ahead and enter the bloodstream. And so that's why we're dismantling the micelle, to allow all of them to become individual and go in whichever direction is easier for them. Now, the fats that are left over that aren't able to enter into the bloodstream are then going to get repackaged into a very similar spherical structure again that we call chylomicrons. Chylomicrons are, again, fat in the center and a hydrophilic layer on the outside, except this time the hydrophilic layer is actually made of phospholipids. But it's the same concept hydrophilic on the inside or hydrophilic on the outside and hydrophobic on the inside and this is going to allow the lymphatic system to carry the fats into the bloodstream eventually so the chylomicrons and the micelles technically sound like very similar structures they're both packaging fats into a spherical structure with hydrophobic fat in the center and hydrophilic outer layers but the way that i want you to differentiate the two is that micelles are what require are what are required for absorption into the cell and then chylomicrons are what are required to transport the fats so micelles help us absorb fats chylomicrons are formed afterwards to help us transport fats So we've already mentioned the chylomicrons. Now that we know what a chylomicron is, we can go ahead and talk about um, the actual structure itself, which is labeled as a lipoprotein. Chylomicrons are a type of lipoprotein. Lipoproteins are exactly what they sound like. They are part protein and part lipid, or fat. So there are fat structures that have some protein in them. The first one that we talked about was chylomicrons, but we have three more, VLDL, LDL, and HDL. And we're gonna go ahead and take a look at uh, what these lipoproteins look like and how they help us transport our fats. So what this here is showing us is what a chylomicron looks like. It is the spherical structure that you see the purple heads or the purple circles on the outside, those are the phosphate heads from our phospholipids. And on the inside, those little tails that you see, those are the fatty acids that are attached to the phospholipid. And then you'll also see that aside from the phospholipid that gives it its outer layer, on the inside we have cholesterol, we have other triglycerides, and we also have protein in the structure because remember a lipoprotein is part lipid and part protein. Now this picture also shows you the differences in the different lipoproteins compositions. So you'll see that they all carry the different types of fats, cholesterol, phospholipids, triglycerides, and they all carry a little protein, but they carry them in different quantities. So this is going to have more significance when we take a look at the uh, roles of each one of these. We'll be able to come back to this um, chart that shows us the different compositions and be able to make sense of that. But for now, let's go ahead and look at how each one of these lipoproteins is going to play a role in carrying our fats around our body.
This picture here is going to show us how the different lipoproteins deliver our fats through our bloodstream. So just keep in mind when we're looking at this pathway over here, this whole pathway is fats moving through our bloodstream. So we're starting off with the intestines up here. We just ate a meal and that meal had some fat in it. We digested the fat and absorbed it. And remember, when we absorb our nutrients, they are absorbed into the cells of our small intestine. So that's where they are stored and they're waiting to be picked up and delivered through our bloodstream. So the fat that was sitting around in our intestines now wants to be transported. But in order for the fats to enter our bloodstream, remember we said the larger ones need to form the chylomicron structure first. And so the larger fats are going to come together into chylomicron form and then they're going to be able to eventually enter into our bloodstream. And that's what we see happening here. These are chylomicrons. They were made from the fat that was digested and absorbed in our intestines. So the fats are going to first be able to enter into the bloodstream in chylomicron form. This is their first time into our bloodstream, and now they're going to be able to move through the blood and deposit their contents into our different cells and tissues. Now this over here is what was left over. After we deposited what was in the chylomicrons, there were parts of the chylomicrons that didn't get deposited, and so that's what you're seeing here, kind of like little leftover pieces of the chylomicrons. Technically, they are referred to as chylomicron remnants. But what we're going to do with these little leftover pieces, whatever didn't get deposited, we're going to go ahead and take those and send them over to the liver. And the reason we're going to do this is because the liver can actually repackage the fats that were part of the chylomicrons, the ones that didn't get a chance to be deposited before, are going to be able to be repackaged into a new lipoprotein that's made by the liver. And this is what we call VLDL. So VLDL is a new lipoprotein made by the liver that's going to allow the little leftover pieces of the chylomicrons to get a chance to be sent out into the bloodstream to be delivered to our cells and tissues and possibly get a chance to be deposited. So the liver will make VLDL. It'll include whatever fats it maybe had previously, but also the fats from the leftover chylomicron pieces. VLDL is going to go ahead and take those fats around our body and also try to deposit them around our cells and tissues. And then what you see over here is kind of the same thing like how we saw with the chylomicron remnants. Remember when we were looking over here, we had this larger chylomicron structure. We deposited as much as we could and what was left over were these smaller structures here. That's the same thing happening with VLDL. VLDL went around and deposited its contents. What, after it deposited what it could, the leftover pieces are what you see over here. We just have them in a different color because we do give them a different name, and that other name is LDL. So VLDL was the one that the body, uh, what, was that the liver packaged and sent out. Whatever VLDL didn't deposit, whatever was left over from VLDL, is what we then call LDL. Again, it's just the leftover pieces of the VLDL's contents, but we give it a different color and a different name because it's actually going to go around the body another time, kind of like a new lipoprotein, even though it isn't a new one. But it's going to go around the body and give the fats another chance to be deposited into our cells and tissues. Now, that was the fat's last chance to deposit in this cycle. So at this point, whatever didn't get deposited, the LDL is going to bring over to the liver, and it's going to hang out in the liver until the next time around, whenever the liver gets a chance to make more VLDL. Whatever was left over from the previous cycle will join together and be part of that VLDL structure. So again, let me go over this one more time. We are going to start off in the intestines. We have the fat that we digested and absorb that wants to be delivered through our bloodstream. It's going to first be able to enter our bloodstream in chylomicron form. In chylomicron form, it will go around the body and deposit in our cells and tissues. Whatever is left over from the chylomicrons 
will make its way to the liver and the liver will package the leftover pieces into this new lipoprotein called VLDL. This will also contain any other fats that the liver had maybe from the previous cycle. So this new lipoprotein VLDL is the, new, the fats that the liver packaged for us to get a chance to send out again. VLDL will go around and try to deposit its contents as well. Whatever didn't get deposited is now this smaller structure here that we call LDL. LDL will then go around again and try to deposit those fats into our cells and tissues. Whatever doesn't get deposited at this point will make its way to the liver and hang around there until the liver packages and sends fats out again. So that is the gist of the first three lipoproteins, our chylomicrons, our VLDL, and our LDL. They're basically just allowing our fats to continue going around, around the body and trying to get a chance to be deposited. Now we do have our fourth lipoprotein that we haven't mentioned just yet, and that was HDL. The reason we haven't mentioned HDL yet is because HDL is actually different than the rest. It is a brand new lipoprotein made from the liver, and what it's going to do is actually go around the body and pick up any excess fats, any excess cholesterol that's not being used, and take it over to the liver so that the liver can either get rid of it or maybe convert it to something beneficial. Like, for example, we know that we can make bile out of cholesterol. So, again, what HDL is doing, we're still carrying fats because lipoproteins are fat carriers, but the other ones, we're carrying our fats to our cells and tissues. HDL is carrying the fats away from our cells and tissues. It's going around and cleaning up all of the excess fats and cholesterol taking them to the liver so that the liver can get rid of them or recycle them, make them into something beneficial or whatever we can do. So HDL is the only one that will be removing excess fats and cholesterol. Now that we've talked about the different lipoproteins, let's go ahead and take a look at the differences between them. Now, we said that all lipoproteins are fat carriers, but some of them can carry fats to our cells and tissues, and the other ones will carry fats away from our cells and tissues. The only one that carried fats away or removed the excess fats was HDL. It was going around picking up all of the excess fats and cholesterol and taking them over to the liver to be removed or recycled or whatever we wanted to do with them. So that's what makes HDL different than the other lipoproteins is that it is the only one that is removing fats instead of depositing them. Now, because of this property of HDL, it's actually usually referred to as our good cholesterol. Now, we just learned about these, so we know that HDL is not a type of cholesterol. It's a type of lipoprotein. But when they are referred to as good or bad cholesterol, what your doctors mean is how the cholesterol is being handled by that lipoprotein. Is that lipoprotein handling cholesterol in a way that it is good for your health or bad for your health? HDL is considered good cholesterol because it handles cholesterol in a way that's good for your health, because it's clearing up the excess cholesterol and taking it away so that it can be removed or recycled, be used to make something beneficial instead of hanging around in your body causing harm. So again, when your doctor tests your blood and sees that you have a bunch of HDL in there, they're viewing that as good because it says you're about to have a bunch of the excess cholesterol cleared up from your system. Now, as for the other three that we have that deposit fats, there's some differences between them as well. Now, we already talked about the good cholesterol, so let's go ahead and take a look at which one would be our bad cholesterol. Now, if we take a look at the three that are depositing fats, the ones that we have left over, these are going to be our chylomicrons, the VLDL, and the LDL, these three that we're looking at over here. And out of those three, if we take a look, cholesterol is in the highest quantity in LDL. Again, out of the three that are depositing fats, LDL has the most cholesterol, so it's going to be depositing the most cholesterol out of the three lipoproteins. And so for this reason, LDL is the one that is referred to as our bad cholesterol. 
Again, the reason for this is out of the three lipoproteins that deposit fats, LDL is going to be depositing the most cholesterol in our cells and tissues, where it can possibly cause harm, lead to uh, increased risk of heart disease. So when your doctor sees that you have a bunch of LDL in your bloodstream, they know that you're about to have a bunch of cholesterol deposited into your cells and tissues. The last one that we mentioned um, that was different than the rest was chylomicrons. Chylomicrons, just to briefly mention um, the difference with chylomicrons, if you take a look, we said chylomicrons are the ones that carry the most triglycerides out of all of the lipoproteins. And just in the chylomicron structure, you see that most of what it's carrying is triglycerides. And that's why we said that chylomicrons are our main triglyceride carriers. So again, the main points that I want you to pick out, chylomicrons are going to be the main ones that deposit triglycerides. So they are referred to as our main triglyceride carriers. HDL is referred to as our good cholesterol because it clears up the excess cholesterol from around our body, so it's good for us. LDL is considered your bad cholesterol because out of the three that deposit fats, LDL is going to be depositing the most cholesterol into your cells and tissues. Now that we know a little bit about the different lipoproteins and what is our bad and good cholesterol, I want to talk a little bit about how this relates to the American diet and our recommendations. Now in the US, we actually have one of the highest incidence of heart disease. So we tend to have a lot of heart disease in the US. It's actually our leading cause of death here as well. Now what this was originally attributed to was high levels of cholesterol in our diet. And the reason for this was because we know that when you have high levels of the bad cholesterol in your body, the LDL, that that raises your risk of heart disease. So again, when you have high levels of cholesterol in your body or high levels of LDL, it increases your risk of heart disease. So it was naturally assumed that the cholesterol in foods that we eat would raise our body's cholesterol levels as well, just because they have the same name. When in reality, after research has been done, recently we've discovered that the cholesterol in food actually has nothing to do with the cholesterol levels in our body. So remember we said that we can get cholesterol from animal products, Animals' bodies make cholesterol, so that's going to be the kind of foods where we would find cholesterol. If you were to get cholesterol from these animal products and ingest them, it's not going to raise your body's levels of LDL. It's not going to raise your body's cholesterol levels. They have no impact on each other. They just have the same name, and so people assumed one would increase the other, when in reality, they actually have no effect on each other's levels. So after they did a little bit more research, what they found out was that when you have high levels of saturated fat in your diet, that's actually what increases your LDL. That's what increases your bad cholesterol. And so since they discovered that, they went ahead and completely wiped off the recommendation to limit our cholesterol levels. We have these dietary guidelines for Americans that kind of give us guidelines for our diet. And before, they used to tell us to limit the cholesterol that we get from foods. Now, they've eliminated that recommendation. They haven't given us an actual limit for cholesterol from foods because they realize it doesn't actually impact the cholesterol levels of our body. Instead, what they are telling us is to limit our saturated fat from foods because they have now discovered that the saturated fat from our diet is actually what raises the cholesterol levels in our body. And when you have higher cholesterol levels in your body, it leads to heart disease. So for our saturated fats, what they are doing is they increase the bad cholesterol, which we know is LDL, but they don't do anything to your good cholesterol. Remember, we said good cholesterol is HDL, and it helps to clean up the excess fats and cholesterol, and it lowers your risk of heart disease. So saturated fats will increase your bad, they increase the LDL, but they leave your HDL or your good cholesterol alone. Now, trans fats are something that we want to completely eliminate from our diets if possible because what they do is they 
are going to now act like saturated fats because they stack like one, right? But they are a little bit worse because not only do they increase the bad cholesterol, but they also lower the good cholesterol. So they kind of hit you from both directions. They increase the LDL, which would increase your risk for heart disease, and they decrease your HDL, which is supposed to protect you from heart disease. So they take away your protection and they increase your risk. And so for that reason, trans fats are considered to be the worst fat and it is recommended to absolutely eliminate them from your diet or minimize them as much as possible. Now, that being said, it really only takes a few grams of trans fat a day to increase your risk for heart disease because of the big impact that it has. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because when you look at food products and you look at the, uh, um, you look at the nutrition facts label, the nutrition facts label will have a section for trans fats, but they actually don't have to list anything there if the food product contains half a gram or less. So if there is half a gram of trans fats or less than half a gram of trans fats, they don't have to let you know that. They can go ahead and just put zero in the area for trans fats and they can market their product as trans fat free, zero trans fats, when it could have half a gram or a little under half a gram of trans fats in there. Now that doesn't seem like an issue, but since we know that it only takes a few grams a day to increase your risk, Imagine if you had a few servings of that food product. Each serving contained half a gram. Now you they're adding up to several grams of trans fat. Or maybe everything that you ate in your day had half a gram or 0.4 of a gram. And then by the end of your day, all of those are adding up to a good few grams of trans fats. But you have no clue that you even had any trans fats at all. This might be something that is concerning if you're somebody who maybe already has increased risk of heart disease or it tends to run in your family or maybe you already have heart disease. And so because of this, um, I want to mention one way that you can kind of get around that. We learned that trans fats are made when we hydrogenate our fats. So one thing you can do if you are concerned about the trans fat content, you have a higher risk of heart disease and you want to completely avoid it, you can look at the ingredients list. The ingredients list will always let you know if there are trans fats in there because it'll say things like hydrogenated oil or partially hydrogenated oil. And we know that hydrogenation causes trans fats. So when you see that, you know there's at least a trace of trans fats in there. And maybe that would be something that you would want to avoid if you are concerned about your trans fat intake. As for keeping an eye on your levels and your risk for heart disease, there is a blood test that you can have done called the blood lipid profile that tests the different levels of lipids, different types of lipids in your bloodstream that can have an impact on your risk of heart disease. I have listed them here for you. So for our total cholesterol, we want to keep that under 200, triglycerides under 150, LDL under 100, and HDL over 60 since it's the one that is good for us so we want more of that one. As for how you're going to try to keep your lipid numbers in check, you can do that by adjusting a few things in your diet. The first thing is to minimize or eliminate processed foods from your diet because that's going to be where you're going to find your trans fats primarily. Another thing is to make sure you're including plenty of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains because these things tend to be lower in fat. So if you're getting plenty of them in your diet, you are displacing the fat that would have taken their place. Another thing that you can do to limit the saturated fats is to watch the fat from animal sources. So for example, things like your meats, your dairy products, that's usually where your saturated fats come from. So if you can make sure to choose lean pieces of meat to get the fat trimmed off as much as possible, or when you're choosing dairy products to make sure you are choosing low fat or fat free, that's going to be your best bet. Again, animal products is not going to be where you want your fat to come from because most of the fat from animal products is saturated. And this is one of the reasons that skim milk or fat-free milk is usually recommended so that you are eliminating that fat that is coming in the milk 
because of the fact that it is going to be primarily saturated. A lot of people worry about this and think that the skim or fat-free milk is not going to be as nutritious as the whole milk. That's actually not the case. It's going to have all of the same nutrients as the uh, whole milk except for without the added fat in there. And that added fat is not something that we want. We don't want to get our fat from milk because, again, it is primarily saturated. So your best bet would be, again, to get either uh, skim or fat-free milk. Same thing uh, for the rest of your dairy products. Try to go for fat-free or low-fat.